You're listening to a mighty fortress, celebrating 500 years of Lutheranism. A mighty fortress is our God, our trusty shield and weapon. Hello and welcome to a mighty fortress. I'm your host, Jake Zabel, and today we're going to have a very serious episode. Because it's a very serious topic, it's a very touchy topic, and I want to make sure that I don't say anything wrong, and I want to make sure that I keep it loving, caring, and considerate. Because here I want to preach the truth, but I want to preach the truth in love. So I want all those who listen to this episode to hear me out, hear what I'm saying, and also to not just jump up and down, don't take offense at things. If I have said something that you deem wrong, I'd ask that you talk to me. You can do that by sending an email to a mighty fortress podcast at yahoo.com.au. You can even contact me by sending a message to the Mighty Fortress Facebook page or to the Order of Night George Facebook page. Either way, if you do disagree with what I say or you want to talk to me more about what I've said, I'm happy to have a conversation with you. I like to keep those conversations reasonable, logic, not emotional, not personal. Just biblical, scriptural, logical, and also kind and caring. I know that in these topics, people can become very emotionally attached, very irrational, and these issues can be blown completely out of proportion. I know that people will instantly, if they don't like what they hear, will to become offended, and they'll start throwing around buzzwords like intolerant, bigot, misogynist, sexist, I don't know, whatever terms they want to use. So I want everybody just to listen for a moment, and just to hear me out. To just think about what I'm saying, to compare it with scripture, to think about it logically, not to become emotionally involved, and not to just let also politics get in the way. Don't just jump up and down and side with what everybody else is saying. Don't just read something on the internet and think you know everything. Research. Study the scriptures. Study science. Try to think about these things logically and reasonably, and try not to become too emotionally attached. Don't let your emotions blind you, because what happens when you let your emotions blind you, you get led astray into a lot of false things. Not only things that are unbiblical, but things that are unscientific and just illogical. And plenty of people that let their emotions lead them will begin to make accusations, they'll begin to become aggressive and violent, call people's names, they'll throw around air quotes, facts, that are not actually really facts. They'll throw around things that aren't true and they'll act as if they're intelligent, but they'll actually make rather stupid comments and actually make very incorrect decisions. So I want everybody to just slow down and stop for a moment. Actually hear what I'm saying. Think about what I'm saying. And if you want to talk to me, either email me or message me over Facebook. That's the best two ways to contact me. If you want to discuss what I've said further, I'm more than happy to discuss it with you. If you're going to discuss it with me properly, then I am very happy to discuss it with you. If you're going to become emotional, you're going to become aggressive and violent, you're just going to be start becoming judgmental and accusative and throwing around buzzwords like sexist and racist and homophobe and intolerant and bigot, I'm not going to listen to you because you're extremely emotional, you're extremely illogical, and you're just attacking me. But if you want to have a proper conversation, a proper scientific, theological, logical conversation, I will talk with you. I'm trying my best to talk about this topic in a gentle, caring, kind, and considerate way. And therefore, I'm going to ask that anybody who wants to talk with me, whether they agree with me or disagree with me, whether they want to just tell me that they agree with me and that everything was great, or if they want to debate with me, I ask that you show me the same respect that I'm going to try and show you now. I'm going to ask that if you want to debate with me, do so in a kind, caring, considerate way. If you're going to debate with me, I'm also going to ask that you don't let your emotions cloud your judgment, that you actually use scripture, science, and logic. Therefore, getting that disclaimer out of the way, today we're going to be talking about the very touchy subject of abortion. Particularly, today I want to talk about what I call the grey areas of abortion. See, on a previous episode of A Mighty Fortress, I went through why I believe abortion is a gospel matter. Why I not only believe that it is wrong scientifically, but why I believe it is wrong theologically. I went through why I believe abortion is murder, and for why it is absolutely dangerous, not only for the physical lives of those involved, but also for the spiritual lives of all those involved, both the mother and the baby. 
If you go to my website, The Order of Night George, and you go to the Shows tab, you can look up, I'm not entirely sure which number that episode was. It's somewhere around the 50s or 60s. There you can go and listen to that episode about why abortion is wrong. Today, I want to focus more on what I call the grey areas of abortion. So firstly, I just want to start off with normal abortion. Why is it wrong? Well, (laughs) abortion is wrong because it's murder. And... The fifth commandment tells us, you shall not kill. We we have biblical evidence to say that the child in the womb from the point of conception is a living human being. Psalm 51 says that, in sin did my mother conceive me. You know, from conception I was a sinner. Well, you can't be a sinner from conception if you're not an actual person. Um, Jeremiah says that you knew me when I was in my mother's womb. Scripture says that God knits us together in the womb. Scripture acknowledges numerous times that the child in the womb is a living child. John the Baptist first met Jesus when him and Jesus were both in the womb. And here, John the Baptist leapt for joy when he heard the voice of Mary talking about the baby Jesus. John the Baptist was about probably six months in the womb at that point. He was into the, th- into the third trimester. He had faith at that point of time. He was a child in the womb and he was the first person to believe in the Messiah. Thus, John the Baptist, while in the womb, became the very first Christian. Those are theological reasons for why I believe the child in the womb, not only later pregnancies, but from the point of conception, is a living human being. It's not a blob of tissue. It's not just some kind of fetus. It's a living child growing and developing in the womb of the mother. For scientific reasons, um, any scientist can tell you that once egg and sperm meet, you have a self-replicating organism that is in a completely different blood type and DNA to the mother. If that's not the definition of life, then I don't know what is. For every organism that can self-replicate, that can self-think, that can rely on itself, that has DNA and blood types different to anyone else, that is an independent human being. See, when you have egg and sperm, they're still parts of the mother or the father. They're just cells. Those are blobs of tissues. Those are cells. But when egg and sperm meet, they form a life. And that's not just biblical, that is science. And therefore, if we acknowledge that the baby in the womb from the point of conception is a human life, and we also acknowledge that murder is wrong, then it is monstrous and abysmal and disgusting that we would even consider killing a baby. If we acknowledge that the child in the womb from the point of conception is a baby, then it is unthinkable to kill a child. For what person is so heartless, so wicked, that they would want to kill an innocent baby? When I say innocent, I don't mean innocent in the sense that they're not a sinner. For we are all born with original sin. In sin did my mother conceive me from the point of conception I as a sinner. But when I say innocent, I'm saying that that baby didn't do anything to you. And you want to kill it. You want to destroy it. That is absolutely disgusting. And I'm sorry I'm starting to get a bit emotional myself. So I want to calm down because as I already said, if we're going to have these arguments, we're going to have these discussions, we need to not let our emotions cloud our judgment. But I want people to think about the fact that if we believe that the child in the womb is a living human baby, then just consider the seriousness of abortion. Consider the seriousness of that. That abortion is legitimately murder of a baby. Abortion is infanticide. So think about that for a moment. So if you don't think that the child in the womb is a child, then of course you could kill it. If it's just a blob of tissues, then there's nothing stopping you from killing it. But I can argue theologically and scientifically that the child in the womb is a child and not just a blob of tissues. Therefore, if you acknowledge that it is a living child, what kind of a sick, disgusting person would want to kill that? And I apologize because I'm starting to become a bit accusative and judgmental there. But That's just the reality, that if I believe that from the point of conception that is a child and that all forms of abortion are killing a living human baby, then I should be rightly offended by that. I should be rightly disgusted. I should be rightly hurt. See, regardless of the choice of the mother, regardless of what the mother's choice is, the mother should not have a choice to end the baby's life. The mother should not have a choice that contradicts the baby's choice to live. See, there is no difference between the child in the womb and the child in the mother's arms. If a mother decided to kill an infant in her arms, that would be considered murder, that would be considered disgusting, that would be considered the worst thing anyone could do. Yet, just because a child's inside the womb, people now think it's okay to kill it. I mean, those who think it's only a blob of tissues, you're wrong. 
but I can see why you don't find it wicked to do so. But for those who do acknowledge it to be a child, then I can't see how you can consider abortion. I can't see how you can so heartlessly kill a child knowing it's a child. The only way I think people can actually commit abortion is by thinking that it is a blob of tissues. And to those people, we need to actually convince them theologically for the Christians and scientifically for both Christians and the non-Christians that it is wrong to do this. I mean, we don't need to talk about morals and things here because most people who admit that murder is wrong we need to talk about the scientific facts that say that this child in the womb is not a blob of tissues but actually is a child. Because if everybody agrees that that child in the womb is a child, only the most heinous, heartless monsters would still want to kill it. And so now I want to get on to what I call the grey areas. So the grey areas are basically those excuses, those defences for committing abortion. And see, I'm not just talking about people that just want to kill the baby because they want a career or that they just don't feel like they're ready to be a parent or they didn't want that baby or they didn't want that gender or whatever the reason was. I'm not talking about these cases. I'm talking about the hard, difficult cases where people actually struggle to decide whether they should get an abortion or not. See, because most people that get an abortion actually aren't just heartless monsters. A lot of the times, the women who get abortions are scared girls. A lot of them probably teenagers. And they're scared and they're upset and they're worried and they don't know what to do. And see, this is why one of the most important things about the topic, one of the most important things for the church to do when we talk about abortion is to not just defund Planned Parenthood. We shouldn't just defund abortion clinics. We shouldn't just stop abortions. We shouldn't just make abortion illegal. In fact, what we need to focus on is helping the mother and the child. See, if women are coming to an abortion clinic with the idea that they want to abort their baby, they're probably scared, they're probably desperate, they're probably in need of some help. And it is here where the church needs to stand up and help these people. It is here where the church needs to reach out and actually say, there's a better way. You don't have to abort your baby. Come to us and we will help you. See, I've heard this accusation used before, but there are some people out there that are, they're, pro, they're not pro-life, they're pro-birth. They claim they're pro-life, but what they really mean is that they're just pro-birth. They just don't want the baby aborted, they want the baby to be born and then they're fine with that. They don't really care about the baby after it's been born as long as the baby is born. See, but as people who are pro-life, we need to think not about the birth of the child, but about the life of the child. We need to consider every stage of life here. And so we need to reach out. We need to help these women and we need to help these children. If we are going to tell women, no, don't get an abortion, then we need to offer a better way. We need to offer a better solution. We need to actually say to the women, hey, I know you're scared. I know you're desperate. I know you're probably poor or struggling or whatever your problem is, but don't abort the baby. Come here. Let us help you. We will help you through the pregnancy. We'll help you financially. If you don't wish to keep the child after you've given and birth to it, we will help you with the adoption process. If you decide to keep the baby after it's been born, we will help you take care of that child once it has been born. See, that's what we need to focus on. See, we need to not just be anti-abortion, but we need to be pro-life. We need to care about the life of the mother and the child. We need to acknowledge as Christians and as pro-lifers that some and probably even most of the women that get an abortion are scared and desperate and just needing some help and guidance. The sad part is that the people who are helping and guiding them are the abortionists who just say, hey, come here and kill the baby and then take those babies and sell their parts. I mean, that is absolutely disgusting to know what Planned Parenthood is doing with the dead baby. Selling baby organs, that is wicked. But we need to actually help these women. We need to let them know that they don't have to turn to abortion clinic. We know that they don't have to choose abortion. We need to let them know that there is another way and that there is a better way. As Christian and as pro-lifers, we need to do everything we can to help the woman and the child. And so this is where we have our first gray area. The first gray area is something like poor or teen. See, women will come and say, I need to get this baby aborted because I'm only a teenager. I haven't got married yet. I can't take care of it. I want to have a career. Oh, I'm poor. I can't take care of the child. There's just no way I can look after this baby. Therefore, I want to abort it. I can't look after it. So therefore, I need to get rid of it. Here. I would instantly say first up that no, that is not a good excuse. See, when I talk about the grey areas of abortion, I'm saying that this is not a black and white decision. It's not just saying babies are living human beings that deserve life and all people who want to abort them are evil. Therefore, you know, we need to condemn abortionists and we need to, you know, promote pro-life. 
Um, it's, it's not a black and white issue. It's, it's, it's a gray area where we need to actually go, hold on. There are people here that are actually scared and desperate. They're not just baby haters. They're not just baby killers. They're actually desperate and they're scared and they're wanting some help and wanting to know what to do with their life. They're wanting to know what to do with this pregnancy. And I'm going to take some of these gray areas and I'm going to shift them into either the black or to the white. And first, I'm going to shift this one into the black. I'm going to say that no, you can't just abort a baby because you're poor or you're a teenager or you want to have a career or whatever the issue is. So if you can't take care of the child, that doesn't instantly give you the right to just say, I'm going to kill it. There are other ways out there. If you can't take care of the child, then give it up for adoption. And if you're worried about that you can't go through with the pregnancy, well, this is why I think pro-lifers need to make an effort to help these women. We need to make an effort to help women go through the pregnancy, give birth to the child. We should help them when they take the child. If they give the child up for adoption, then we need to be there to help the adoption process and find that child a good home. See, this is what we need to do as pro-lifers. We need to not just condemn abortion as sin, but we need to turn our focus towards helping the mother and the child. If a mother is poor or a teenager or homeless or whatever, we need to help her give birth to the child and either help her take care of that child once it's born or help her put that child up for adoption, help that child through the adoption process and help that child find a good home. The next grey issue is rape. Now, I know that rape and incest are two examples constantly thrown out by the pro-abortionists. See, the problem with that is the pro-abortionists throw this term out there. They throw this example out there as if to say, therefore, all abortions are okay. Well, that's wrong because just because this small window of abortions is okay doesn't mean that all abortions are okay. You can't just take an exception to the rule and then apply it to make a new rule. What we need to do is we need to establish that, first of all, abortion is wrong. Everybody agrees abortion is wrong. That's where we need to start. Then we can start looking at individual cases and going, how do we deal with this? The first one is rape. See, because this one, it's like the previous issue. I'm going to say no. I'm going to, I know that sounds harsh. And I know this would be hard. And I can't even imagine what it'd be like to be a woman that had been raped and to be pregnant because she'd been raped. I can't imagine what that would be like. I can't imagine the hardship and the fear and the suffering you've been through. And I'm not even going to pretend to understand. But the sin performed by that rapist should not mean that you punish the child. See, if a man rapes a woman and that woman becomes pregnant, we need to punish the rapist, not the child. We need to arrest the rapist and we either need to castrate them or kill them. I think we need to bring back capital punishment, especially for people like that. But the child, and particularly the woman, should not suffer because that woman's been raped. The child should not be punished because of what that rapist did. And see, I know this case is a definitely a hard one because, well, I mean, the woman wants to forget everything about what happened to her. She wants to find healing, which is why the church needs to be there to say it's okay. You have not committed any sin. Jesus loves you. Jesus cares for you. And Jesus washes you clean of everything. And he cares for you. And he'll hold you in his arms and he'll protect you. We need to be there to provide reassurance and help and healing. And as for the child, we need to do the same thing that we did for the teenager or the poor woman. We need to help this woman give birth to this child. We can't let her abort the child. We need to be there to support it. We need to help this woman through this pregnancy. And we need to help her not only physically and financially, but we're going to have to be there to help her psychologically. Because she was raped, and that's going to have a huge psychological impact. Which means that every day that she goes through that pregnancy, she's going to be reminded of that night, or that or day whenever she was raped. She's going to be reminded of that event when she was raped. And that's going to have such a huge psychological impact toll on that woman and we need to be there to support her financially physically and emotionally and psychologically and when the child is born we need to take care of the adoption process and give that and find that child a good home see i instantly just jumped to adoption there because again i'm not going to pretend to know what women go through i'm not going to pretend to know what a rape victim feels but in my assumption i'm going to assume that a woman who conceived a child when she was being raped is not going to want to have that child around because that child is going to remind her of that horrible night that child's going to remind her and she's going to have probably a hate and a disdain for that child which that child doesn't deserve either and that's going to have a bad psychological effect on that child about probably even bad physically and emotionally on that child therefore it'd be safer to not let that child be raised in that household I mean, 
if the mother wants to raise a child, so be it. It's her child, it's her right. And I would say then that we as the church again should be there to help her take care of that child. But I think the best outcome would be that if a woman is raped and she conceived a child, the best option I say is that the child needs to be born and then the child needs to be put up for adoption. And I think the church and pro-lifers, we need to be there for the whole process. We need to help the woman through the pregnancy. We need to help her through the birth. We need to help the child through the process of finding a good home. We need to help that woman too to adjust after even after the child has been born. We don't just take away that that spiritual and emotional and physical and financial care just after the child is born. We need to be there to help her for the rest of her life. But actually it's the job of Christians in the church to be there for people, to help people. So we move on to the next one, and this one's a much more trickier case, and this is a case of incest, which I said many people like to throw out. And the question is, will this child suffer deformities? Because there's a good chance that because they're born from incest, they will suffer deformities. However, I'm going to say that Incest is not a reason for abortion because just because you're conceived through incest and you're going to have um, deformities doesn't mean that we should just kill you because if we're going to kill a child in the womb just because they may suffer from deformities then why don't we kill living people because they have deformities why don't we kill people who are disabled why don't we kill people who are old and injured see we shouldn't just kill people because they're a burden Instead, we need to make every effort to help those people. And see, if a child is conceived through incest and they are going to suffer some physical deformities from that, then we need to help them just as we would help any other disabled person. We need to care for them and be there. And again, for the mother, we need to give her the same kind of support we give everybody else in this situation. Therefore, we look at the list of reasons for abortion. Reasons such as just because... Reasons for being a teenager, being too young, reasons for being poor, reasons for rape and reasons for incest, I would say no. They they are not good reasons to commit abortion. If anybody proposed that reason in order to perform an abortion, I would say no. But on top of that, I'd also add that we need to be there to care for the women and the children involved. And also the men. I mean, each of these children have a father and he needs to be cared for just as well. He needs to be cared for as well as the mother and the child. We need to not forget that The man is actually the father of this child and he has a right to that child as well. We need to care for all the members of this family. Men, women, children. But see now, I want to get to another case. And this is basically the whole reason why I wanted to do this podcast. Because I wanted to talk about the case of entopic pregnancies. And see, this is a grey area of abortion, which I'm actually going to put into the white. I'm going to say that yes, in this case, abortion would be okay. And before all the pro-life has jumped down my throat, let me please explain what I'm talking about. See, an atopic pregnancy from the word out of place is when a pregnancy takes place outside of the womb. It means that the egg has been fertilized, but instead of attaching to the uterine wall, it's attached somewhere most, mostly in the fallopian tubes. Sometimes these are called tubal pregnancies. The egg attaches to the wall in the fallopian tube and it starts replicating starts growing this embryo is actually a living child it's a conceived child it's a human being like any other and it's growing this embryo is a human being the problem is that it's not going to survive see because within topic pregnancies the child cannot survive they don't get enough nutrients and they can't grow see because when the child is in the uterus it grows and it just grows in the womb there it is nourished there it is protected and there it can come to full term but a child that is in the fallopian tube will die and if it doesn't die from lack of nutrition and come out as a miscarriage then it's going to keep growing till it eventually busts open the fallopian tube and actually will cause heaps of internal bleeding to the mother and will cause the mother to die See, there are two ways that you can deal with the entopic pregnancy. The first one is surgery, where the surgeon actually has to cut the woman open and take the embryo out of the fallopian tube. In doing this, the embryo dies. It can't live. Once you take it out of the fallopian tube, it dies. The child is dead. This option is not the best option because it can leave scarring in the fallopian tubes, which will create further complications for future pregnancies. So, the best option that most doctors will suggest is taking some kind of drug or chemical which will actually abort the baby, which is thus an abortion. This, I would actually say, 
is a legitimate case where abortion can take place. See, I think we need to remember that we are killing a human life here, and there's no doubt about that, and it's a sad thing, but we need to realize that if we don't abort this baby, it's not only going to kill itself, but also the mother. See, an atopic pregnancy cannot last. That is a living child that has attached to the fallopian tube, but that living child will die before it reaches full term, and if we allow it to try and go full term, it will kill the mother also. So here we have two choices. Let the baby alone, allow it to grow and kill both itself and the mother. Or, we can abort the child, killing the child and saving the mother. It's sad, and it's a heartbreaking situation, but I think it's one that has to happen. Therefore, in this episode on the grey areas of abortion, the one grey area that I would say yes to is an atopic pregnancy. Because if the pregnancy is going to kill both the child and the mother, then there's no point in letting the pregnancy continue. Because if we let it continue, you're going to gain nothing. If you stop the pregnancy, you can save the mother. If you let the pregnancy continue, you'll lose both child and mother. See, in the case of an atopic pregnancy, we cannot just say simply, no, abortion is wrong. Because if you say, we can't abort this child, then you're going to end up killing both mother and child. And... While it is sad that one life must die, even scripture itself acknowledges that it is better for one man to die than the whole nation to die. It is better for one life to be lost so that other lives may be saved rather than all the lives dying. Thus, in the case of an atopic pregnancy, I would say yes to abortion. And no, that doesn't make me a pro-abortionist. I'm still pro-life. I'm not pro-choice. But I do think that there are some difficult cases where we have to say yes to abortion and it's a difficult yes it's a heartbreaking yes it's a heartbreaking situation but i think it needs to be a yes and i just want to add to that though that this exception to the rule does not instantly make all abortions okay i still condemn abortion i still say abortion is sin i still say abortion is wrong i say that all other forms of abortion are wrong and they should not be done However, in the case of an atopic pregnancy, for the sake of the mother's life, then we need to perform an abortion. But that's only for the case of entopic pregnancies. I don't think there's anything more I can say on this topic. If anybody wants to discuss this topic with me further, I would love to talk with some people about it. Uh, again, if we're going to chat about it, I ask that we do it calmly, considerately, lovingly, and that we're going to argue it using the Bible, science, and logic and that we don't just get blindly led by emotions. I'm going to thank everybody for listening to this episode of A Mighty Fortress. I know this is not the most pleasant topic. Join me again next week when we're going to have probably another episode concerning false gospels. Next week on the false gospel of universalism. So thanks for listening to A Mighty Fortress. I've been your host, Jake Zabel. Goodbye and God bless.